What's up, everybody? We're gonna get Mr. Degati on the phone here in a second. I'm gonna get you guys uh, some serious info on the shoulder. There he is. What's up, buddy? What's up, man? How are you? I'm great. Let me just get the earphones plugged in here. There you go. All right. We're set. We are good to go. Let's talk so, shoulders. What's that, bud? Let's talk about shoulders. Let's talk about shoulders. All right. So um, if you caught any of our posts in this previous week, uh, we were talking a lot about the shoulder. We were talking about um, everything from breathing to thoracic spine to scapula to the actual glenohumeral joint. And um, we covered uh, various topics. But today, what we wanted to do is really dig a little bit deeper and talk about the intricacies of the shoulder because when people think about shoulder mobility they just think about the glenohumeral joint they don't they don't necessarily look at the other aspects of uh, the other aspects of mobility like breathing like the positioning of the thoracic spine scapular positioning etc so those are some things that we're going to dive right into but um, why don't we start with uh, you know something that eric's really good at talking about which is uh, the breathing component so eric why why do you think that uh, well we know why but let's let's talk about um, how breathing can impact shoulder function. Uh, so, so breathing impacts, and we did a whole, a whole week on, on just breathing alone, but breathing impacts things on, on kind of three levels. Um, and I kind of use what we call our triad of health for that. It impacts things on a, uh, obviously on a psychological level and how that impacts your, your stress levels and, and uh, the impact on the autonomic nervous system and that kind of hack into, into how we can control that balance of parasympathetic versus sympathetic stress it has impact on your physiological systems in terms of uh, um, all your physiological processes down to um, you know uh, the cellular level and what's happening there but most most directly you can see impacts on your your mobility in the shoulders because of a structural component in that your lungs are directly underneath your thorax um, and every time you breathe that should expand laterally post anterior posteriorly and there's some of the muscles that are surrounding the shoulder joint, including your scalenes or accessory respiratory muscles. So breathing, you know, more of a diaphragmatic breath versus breathing more of an apical chest type of breathing is going to affect your uh, shoulders. You know, a little demo that, that I do when we teach is that if you kind of put, you know, if you're home, you put one hand on your chest, you put one hand on your belly, you take a nice deep breath. And a good relaxed breath, you should feel your belly move and not really much happening in your chest. Well, what happens is as those lungs need to expand and they need to expand more rapidly and under stressful situations, they can also draw up. Well, some people just do that even in non-stressful rested situations and they do this apical breathing. Well, if you take your fingertips and you kind of wrap them around your, your clavicles like this and you take that stress breath, those muscles you'll feel kind of take a stranglehold in your fingertips. That's your scaling. That's those accessory respiratory muscles. Now imagine doing that, you know, 15 times a, a minute times, you know, 60 minutes and, and an hour times 24 hours a day. And now you're totaling up 20,000 of those where these are getting jacked up. And what happens is that will pull, start to pull your head forward as they adaptively shorten. And then now what you start to do is change the positioning and posture. And in the, the first video of the week, we talk everything in the shoulder really is based on positioning and posture and the relationship between the upper arm, the shoulder blade, the clavicle, the thorax, uh, including the T-spine and rib cage, as well as the cervical spine. And so all you need is one thing out of that whole puzzle to be off. And now everything has to kind of change around that. And even if you just kind of poke your head forward and then bring your hand overhead, you're going to feel a very different sensation than if you were to bring your head back into good tall posture. And so, you know, that's just the first way. And we can do all the shoulder correctives in the world, right? You can do whatever stretching or do you can do any kind of clinical interventions or any of those things. They're not going to make a dent against 20,000 breaths a day that are done really poorly. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that, uh, and obviously we don't want to beat a dead horse when it comes to breathing because we could probably talk about breathing and the various components of breathing as it relates to mobility, but there's two things I want to really kind of uh, touch upon. So one, you mentioned, um, you know, obviously your secondary and tertiary breathing musculature, which is essentially everything up here. And then your diaphragm is really your primary breathing musculature. And, you know, as you initiate a breath, it starts with the diaphragm and it does finish 
um, in the upper thorax. But like any type of compensation, right? You roll your ankle, you start to walk a little bit differently. Well, the same thing can happen um, with, with your breathing patterns, right? You Something could happen, it could be a traumatic event and all of a sudden your breathing gets a little bit out of whack. And if you're not aware or tuned into the fact that you could be changing the way that you position your body or breathe, that could lead to some some ugly things down the road. And I'm not saying that, you know, you're gonna get scared, you're gonna hyperventilate, and then you're gonna be hyperventilating for the rest of your life. That's not what I'm saying, but we have to, we do have to understand that breathing and, uh, you know, the basic function of breathing is going to absolutely impact mobility. And, you know, I see this with a lot of my type A, um, you know, clients that are, they're go, go, go from, you know, five in the morning until they go to bed, they're just go, go, go. And those people tend to be, not all of them, but tend to be very, very upper trap dominant and they're chest breathers. So everything they do, they're kicking in this stuff 24 seven. And that is not optimal, especially from a, you know, from a shoulder function standpoint. And Eric, you made a great, uh, you just gave a great uh, example of, you know, if you push your, 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 uh, your neck forward into that anterior cervical glide, and then you try to go overhead. Well, guess what? It's not going to go well. Well, the same thing happens when you're shrugging. If you're shrugging constantly, it's going to inhibit your neck. And if your neck is not functioning the way that it should, it's going to impact everything down below because really the cervical spine is the fuse box for the upper extremities when it comes to all the nerves that innervate from that. So um, that's hugely important that people need to understand. And guys, we're not saying you have to go and spend all day focusing on breathing, but if you are aware of how you're supposed to be breathing at rest, you should try to be aware of that breathing pattern throughout the day, because that's what's going to make the biggest impact on function overall, is being aware initially of what you need to focus on, and then constantly reminding yourself throughout the day. And um, if you start to do that overall, um, it's, it's going to improve the way that you feel and the way that you move. And yes, today we're talking about the shoulder, but we, we can't talk about the shoulder if we don't talk about breathing, because I do think, and especially when we're teaching, you know, with our, with our FMS courses and even our principles of program design courses, we talk about the importance of breathing. We give people very, very uh, concrete sort of examples where they can actually feel the difference. So, um, you know, breathing is, is a huge component of it. And, and we, we're, we're going to cover that um, in our live course at our principles of program design live course that we're going to be, uh, that we're going to be putting out there within the next few months. But Let's talk about the uh, the next sort of step in the puzzle. We've got breathing, but um, one of the things, again, people um, really forget about is the positioning of the thoracic spine and um, how that affects shoulder function. So I'm going to kind of let you fly on that one, Eric. Well, yeah, so the, so you have all these interrelated parts that have to have, and, and there's actually in the terminology that, that you hear when you talk about the shoulder is these different rhythms that you should have. Like it should have all happen in this, this orchestration when your arm moves freely. Because you have this uh, upper arm that, that has a ball and socket joint, but it's very little stability from a bony standpoint. It's almost like uh, the, the, the head of your upper arm, your humerus is almost like a beach ball on a, on a golf tee, right? Is the analogy I've heard. And so you, there's not really much bony support. So a little bit comes from the musculature around there. And then you have, as that moves, you know, right to left or in and out or abducts or adducts, you need to have certain things move with it at certain timing. So you have your scapular humeral rhythm where your arm comes up overhead and that shoulder blade should upwardly rotate as that happens. You have your uh, scapular thoracic rhythm where as your scapula moves, your, your T-spine should start to move a little bit. And so uh, all those things have to happen in the symphony. So if you bring your arms up overhead, and I had a post about this yesterday, there's things we want to see, there's things we don't want to see. The things we do want to see is that we want to see that scapula move with that at a certain point, and there's a certain timing that you should see with that. You also want to see that that T-spine, which is an outward curve, that upper back's an outward curve, that should reverse somewhat. That should extend as your arms come up overhead. And if that doesn't happen, you could just do the same thing we did earlier. Go ahead and really round your upper back and, and make yourself into that kyphotic rounded spine. And now bring your hands up overhead, and you start to feel this really crappy, pinchy feeling in there. Well, that impingement you're getting has nothing really to do with the shoulder joint itself. It's a byproduct of not moving your T-spine as you start to, start to bring your hands up overhead. So we have to get all these parts to kind of work in sync. And, you know, I, you know, I, I date myself the more I talk and, and that, you know, when I first started learning training, you know, we used to learn the old retract the scapula and then do your pull, right? As you start to learn to get your scapula moving, which may have some merit if you have someone who doesn't have any association in terms of awareness of their scapular movement, but, Ultimately, that's not the right way to do it. There should be this smooth rhythm that we should see where we shouldn't have to really coach 
that scapula to stick in any one position that all these things are dynamic and it's fluid and it's this orchestration of all these different parts that have to kind of happen. Um, and so, you know, when we look at the shoulder, we look at it like we do in, in all our stuff that we do in the course, it's all just a bunch of checklists, right? We have our checklist to say, well, do I have number one, do I have enough mobility? Is, is movement my issue? And if I do have enough mobility, do I have enough control of that range of motion or mobility? Um, and sometimes one of those can get hidden as the other, meaning you'll have people that appear to have stiff shoulders, uh, but it's really just a lack of motor control. And that's an a adaptive response, a protective response. Or you have the opposite. You have people that have a control issue um, that, that is high, showing itself as a mobility issue. So you, you kind of have both, both ends of that. And then once you have that, and you have, is, you, there's just a matter of strength. Like, do you have enough strength? And we talked about that one in the post when I talked about the strength ratios of the different areas. And then from there, then it's just that to the dynamics of the environment you're going back to, right? So there's the dynamics of um, somebody that just needs to get the, the stuff off the top shelf or um, somebody at the other end of the extreme, which is what you deal with, Mike, is where you, you have a bunch of friends, they try to rip each other's shoulders out of the joint, okay, and, and, and with your fighters. So that's a, if we take it, let's work our, our way back. So let's take it to the extreme, right? You have people that roll around for hours at a time trying to dislocate each other. What's that like? Yeah, well, um, let's just say that um, if we won't get too, too deep world of, of my sport of jujitsu and the guys that I train but let's just say this if you have really really gunked up shoulders um, your chances of, of getting caught in a submission due to that lack of range of motion are definitely increased and uh, I've seen some really 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 strong guys that in here you can't budge them you get them to abduct their shoulder and they're weak as a kitten right so um, that is obviously a, it's a very extreme example um, because of all these different submissions like Americanas and, and uh, arm bars and, and kimuras and stuff like that but having that extreme range of motion is beneficial for those athletes just like it is with baseball players and pitchers right I mean you've worked with with you know hundreds of baseball players and they kind of have similar demands if you think about it because we have to have quality range of motion and you have to have ownership of that range of motion well, I, I think the primary difference m might be, yes, we, we have to have, we have to, that's where you get into our whole extremes versus norms conversation we have in the course. But the, the, the big difference, I think, is you're doing it in more static challenges mm -hmm. um, where we're much more dynamic, where the, the speed of the upper arm and, and how it's moving is one of the most violent things you could do to a shoulder from a, a, a movement standpoint, obviously. Someone, on a 200 something pound guy on top of you trying to rip your shoulder off is pretty violent too. But from a different perspective, from the speed of the movement that that's happening when someone's throwing 95, 100 miles an hour. And so when we talk about the, the higher incidence of arm injuries, it's just because there's so much force being put through that. And, they, and then one of the big keys is we transition from control into strength and to power and where it all kind of comes together is can you decelerate that arm? Right. And from my perspective, from a from a throwing perspective, or even if you're a tennis athlete and you're serving because they're serving the ball 100 miles plus uh, an hour. So can you decelerate that? Because that's where most of the injuries occur. And if you look at the, the great work of Dr. Tom House and what he discovered with doing a lot of work with weighted balls and discovering, well, why is it that tennis athletes don't have nearly the amount of shoulder and arm problems that the throwers do? Well, because they don't release the racket. And a part of that comes out to deceleration. And that's where there's a lot of drills and Another one of posts I put up this week is we do it a million different ways of working on decelerating the arm, whether it's just body weight, whether it's doing stuff with plyo balls, whether it's doing stuff with bands, whether it's doing stuff with, you know, badminton rackets or, um, you know, doing stuff with, with water bags or uh, any of those things that we can use to help to, to train that rapid deceleration and access to your rotator cuff. Um, which we got to get into in a second, your rotator cuff and what steers and, and controls that, that arm. But let's take a big step back, right? How many people walk into your facility, you meet at a party or, you know, wherever, and the first thing I bring up, and this is why we kind of got the idea of the shoulder, say, yeah, I got, I got a, you know, I can't work out anymore. I got a shoulder, you know, I got a rotor cup. And I got the rotor cup problem, right? The rotor you cup. Those? Yeah. You should bring it, you should, if your rotor cup's broken, you should go to the mechanic. Yes, yes, the rotor cup. It does not get in the required 1.21 gigawatts. Um, but like, from the average person, there's a lot of people who say, well, I can't do that anymore. I can't throw a ball anymore. I can't, you know, I can't do, I can't bench press anymore. Right? I can't do this anymore because 
because I an old shoulder injury, I have my I have bum shoulders, whatever you want to call it, right? Like, where, what's the path? Like, where do we go with that person? Do we just say accept that and say no? That's you're right. Don't ever throw a ball to your kid. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I think the big thing is, I think this is where uh, a quality assessment really makes all the difference in the world. Because again, and when we're looking at the way that we evaluate looking at shoulders, and, and again, you can go down some crazy rabbit holes, especially with the stuff that you do and some of the work that Eric Cressy does. But, you know, when we're looking at evaluating your shoulder, we have to look at, obviously, we want to look at extremes and norms, but we talk about this in the course as well. So what are you asking of your body? And um, you use a great example, and I'll let you tell that story about, you know, thoracic spine rotation and how much do you need. But again, it goes back to the assessment and where you're currently at, where is your starting point. And then once you understand where your starting point is, then you start to um, create a, a game plan to start to improve function, whatever that may be. For some, it's going to be mobility. Um, for some, it's going to be stability. But that is really why we need to start with with a quality assessment because that's going to give us the necessary information to start making better decisions yeah so you know the, the t-spine story and, and, and thoracic rotation story mike's talking about is if i assess somebody's t-spine rotation whether it's here or with a dowel on the back and we're looking for about 45 degrees but that's just like minimum that's like get in the door minimum that's not extreme so if i test somebody's you know t-spine rotation they say is that good i'll say that's great you have all the t-spine rotation you need to be an accountant but if you're going to go out and swing a golf club or you're going to go out and do anything that requires some some dynamic and, and sometimes violent rotation you're going to need a whole bunch more than that because if you don't get it from here you're going to find it someplace else and usually that's going to be either above or below it's going to be at the shoulder and and, and arm or it's going to be at the low back now, the other thing that I think is completely uh, forgotten about quite a bit with the shoulder is, is you kind of talked, I love the, 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 uh, the term of using the junction box, the, the cervical spine is the junction box for the shoulder. Well, the gateway to the shoulder is your grip, right? And we can tell a whole lot about what's going on in your shoulder with your grip. Now, so from an assessment standpoint, we look at grip strength. And so a couple things. One, anytime we've seen a significant asymmetry, and this is just, you know, I'm sure there's some data and some research with this, but I can tell you just anecdotally from, from looking enough people, anytime you've seen a significant difference, like over big 10% difference between right and left and grip strength, almost always there's a shoulder and or cervical spine issue going on there, okay? Um, and then, so we look at that from an assessment and baseline you know, you know, data standpoint. But then we also look at it from the training aspect to say we can actually use that to our advantage because that irrigation that happens when we, we, we go to grab something or we go to apply force through our hand is that how our hand is, is establishing that communication line all the way up into the shoulder helps tell the shoulder, well, it's time to get to work. So like when we talk about, you know, push-ups and anything where we're on the ground, we we'll always talk about spreading out the hand and grabbing the ground. So that way we can assess, that's basically telling your shoulder, hey, we mean business here, you better get ready to work. Or if we're gripping something, and whether we're pulling or pushing or holding, I always tell people to squeeze, squeeze the, the, the crap out of the bar, because that, again, sends the signal to the shoulder that this is going to be a significant challenge, you need to brace yourself. And something I've actually used in the past is uh, getting from Home Depot the foam wrapping that goes around like your pipes in the basement so you don't touch a hot pipe and burn yourself is get that and cut it into, you know, maybe three, four inch lengths that, that match up with the uh, inside of your dumbbell, or you can just use it for your hands to put around the bar and coach people to squeeze that. Like if you had a sponge, squeeze everything out of it, and that will help get them to get better shoulder bracing. Yeah, I like that. It's kind of like a fat grip, but it doesn't have, it, it loses shape a little bit. So you can actually get that feedback of gripping. I've never heard that, but, um, but you know, I'm going to, I'm totally going to steal that and I won't give any credit for it at all. Um, 100%. So, yeah, and guys, here's the scoop that, you know, don't hear what we're not saying. You can't just grab a pair of grippers and expect everything to get fit, right? That is just, uh, that's sort of trying to, that's trying to, um, you know, just study the answers to the test, right? I mean, uh, you, you know, maybe you can get a little bit out of it, but it, it's, it's definitely not going to be, you're not going to learn much long term. Um, so, you know, going back to obviously there's, there's the, the cervical spine, which is absolutely the fuse box. But, um, the other thing we need to really look at is, is scapular positioning and, and how the scapula impacts, uh, movement and function because, and, and you mentioned this earlier, the down and back for the longest time, 
you know, people were telling, uh, you'd hear everybody use the same cue, get your shoulder blades down and back, get your shoulder blades down and back. And that is a strategy for a specific adaptation. Like if you're bench pressing and you're trying to create a really, really nice platform and you're doing, you know, the bottom of a bench press, you're trying to really, really drive those scapula down and back and you're really trying to utilize that grip. That's a fantastic strategy. But, you know, if you're um, if you're trying to do some sort of overhead movement and you're trying to lock that scapula back and down, you're going to restrict movement. And the same thing actually happens with a bunch of other things that we do like deadlifting. Um, the positioning of the scapula, even though we're talking about the shoulder, but the, the positioning of the shoulder and the scapula is going to impact how you deadlift. So it's, remember, you're, if you're lifting anything with, uh, with your hands, if you're using any sort of external load, the, the shoulder's involved. So you have to appreciate what the heck's going on with the overall function, because if you don't, you're going to be missing something. I'm telling you, if you've ever had any type of cervical issue where you get a little bit atrophy or you, you, know, you start to lose a little bit of function in the arm, man, it's a... Uh, it's a pain. It's, it's, it's something that is, uh, is really tough to overcome, especially over time. But, um, you know, let's, uh, let's also remember too, we're going to be, we're digging pretty deep into this stuff, but always go back to the, uh, the one thing we talked about earlier, what are you asking of your body? And I think anytime you should be, you know, thinking about an assessment or what you're supposed to be doing, just remember, what are you asking of your body? Because, um, that is going to dictate how much you need. And like Eric said, he's did that, you know, seated T-spine, you get 40, 45 degrees. And, you, you know, you kind of said jokingly, well, that's enough for an accountant, but it, it might just be enough for an accountant. But, you know, if you're trying to throw 96 or hit a, you know, hit a golf ball, um, you know, 300 yards, you're going to need every bit of movement um, that's possible. So. Yeah. And then, and then posture, obviously, you got to consider, well, what is this person doing throughout the day? You haven't someone who's, especially now, you know, post COVID who's there's workstation is a laptop at a kitchen table and they're rounded in that, 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 you know, upper cross syndrome type of posture for eight hours a day. Plus, you know, when you show up, at, it, it, they show up at your, at your clinic or your, your gym and you're going to give them a 30 second doorway stretch on each side. Do you think you're really making a dent? Like you're emptying the ocean with a Dixie cup, buddy. Like you're not going to make that change. So we have to understand, you know, movement is a habit. And we have to understand we need to change habits beyond just giving a battery of corrective exercises that we think are going to do this magical trick. They may create some awareness of how to get in those positions, but we need to consider when we look at posture of the long-term effects of what are happening habitually throughout the day. The other thing with, with posture and some of the cues, like the down and back thing, you know, I, you know, I haven't heard that one in a while, but the cue that I kind of have found that I lean on for upper body posture more than anything is tell them wide collarbones. Like if you just think of your, your clavicles, just think of wide collarbones, like it almost just puts you just in a good tall posture with that wide collarbones, wide collarbones, and then get tall kind of gets the spine upright and gets it here. Cause once that happens, everything happens better. Meaning you'll have better rotation. You'll have better movement of the arm in any direction. Once we get that, that longer spine and once we get the, the collarbones wide, that means we're not in an elevated or forward rounded or any of these different positions. Um, so those are some of the cues that we use. Now, in terms of limitations, right, one of the big ones is overhead reaching. Right? And I kind of talked about the things that we want to see. We want to see that the, that the scapula moves. We want to see the T-spine moves. What we don't want to see is what you talked about. We don't want to see elevation. Once you don't want to see this elevate because that's going to better and that's going to create issues we also don't want to see as your hands come overhead how many times you see somebody's low back sway forward and they go into a bunch of extension at the hip and, and, and lumbar spine and they're usually doing that because they can't either a disassociate and they don't have the control and they kind of fall into that lordotic posture or b what they'll also do is they'll try to make up for they, they, if they don't have that T-spine extension because they're just so locked into that kyphosis that they're going to make up for it by a bunch of lumbar extension. And you see how many overhead presses people are now come out of it and say, my low back is jacked up. And it really was a matter of not your low back. Your low back got caught in the crossfire downstream from a lack of thoracic extension. So looking at those positions and postures and how it relates from that whole concept of regional interdependence where we need to have to, to have this mobility here. We need to have stability in other places as well. And so if we don't get that mobility, say in the T-spine, we're going to try to make up for it someplace else, probably a place that doesn't want to move all that well. Yeah. And that's just, and that's the whole idea of compensation. And, and, and here's the scoop, right? You know, minimal compensation adaptations are, are going 
hurt, right? So if you ask your body to do something repetitively, even if you're not consciously doing that, like sitting, like sitting is in the way that you sit in that rounded posture in that forward head posture and bringing those shoulders forward, that is simply an adaptation, okay? It's, you're sitting long enough, your body's gonna say, hey, I'm gonna get you better at sitting. And that's what it's going to do because it literally takes less energy to be in this sort of slump posture. It takes a little bit more energy to be in that upright posture, especially if it's a posture that you're not acclimated to. So that's something you have to sort of consider as well. But, but um, again, all of these things, the shoulder is a super complex joint and um, you can see why so many people sort of have issues with the shoulder um, because again, we're talking about breathing, we're talking about T-spine, scapula, neck, actual glenohumeral joint. Um, but I, I, we'll, we'll kind of move forward a little bit. And we were talking about this earlier is the rotator cuff. And, and that's the big one, right? A lot of people come in and, you know, I got this old, you know, rotator cuff injury. And, uh, um, you know, they've, they've done some rehab. And usually, I hate to say it, but the majority of the rehab is a little bit of sideline, external rotations. And that's all they've done. And um, don't get me wrong, that exercise early on. Is, is not a bad thing, but down the road, we have to be a little bit more dynamic and we have to start exploring ranges of motion, especially uh, from a specificity standpoint, if you're working with an overhead or a throwing athlete. So, um, you know, let's talk about the rotator cuff a little bit, Eric. Um, you know, how, what is the job of the cuff? It's to basically steer and control the upper arm. It's not a drive, it's not a prime mover. It's a, it's a, it's a controlling agent, it's a steering wheel. And so, a lot of times I think, here's what I found, is when people come in and say I have a rotator cuff issue, it's never a rotator cuff issue. Now, the reason they got that is because, it's A, it's the only shoulder muscle they know the name of, um, and, and they, they want to sound, you know, kind of, you know, experienced in what they're looking for. But, but B is because you can get, I mean, if you went and took films of anybody's shoulder that's over 35 years old, you're going to find some level of, of scar tissue or something, some sort of, you know, uh, pathology within the rotator cuff tissue. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's that it's symptomatic and that that's your the root of your problem. And then so we look at the rotator cuff and, and, and kind of talking about training and rehab gone bad is we just assume a we assume that it's a strength issue, right? We assume that it's a, a, a force production issue. So we're going to tie a rubber band to a doorknob and then do external rotation, internal rotation, and assume that that is the issue. It may or may not be right, and and then it, it also strength is specific to its positioning, right? And that we have length tension relationships, and that it depends on its positioning, and it depends on the relationship with the scapula. So the example I give with with that is the stability of your scapula is let's imagine you tie that rubber band to the door to do some external rotation, but you don't shut the door, right? The door is just going to sway with you. You're not getting anything out of the band. You're not creating any tension to even produce strength. Right. So if you don't teach people the awareness and the positioning and posturing of the, of the scap, then it doesn't really matter. And if the only way you do that is by locking them into a sideline position, then you didn't really teach them anything that they're going to be able to, to take out there dynamically. Now, that's different than someone coming off of a post-surgical thing where it may actually be an atrophy and, and weakness thing. But you have to be able to classify and have that checklist of, of other things that we need to look into first. And then. Talking about the, the example that I'll give with, with training gone bad or, or the mistake that a lot of people make is we talked about overhead reaching. What's the, the other big motion that people are challenged with is reaching behind their back, right? Whether I'm trying to put on a jacket or I'm trying to reach behind me and I just can't get there, especially on your dominant arm. And so we automatically make the assumption that that's an internal rotation issue, the glenohumeral joint. And Mike Reinhold did a great thing on his one of his, his uh, podcasts talking about that that's usually more often an extension issue right yeah. and that's a big one where the pec minor is the, is is the big uh culprit there because if you think about that rounded shoulder that pec minor adaptively shortens and buckles down that shoulder down and forward now you go to try to extend and you don't have any and then you try to internally rotate on top of that it's just not going to go where we can get more of that reaching behind your back picked up by usually cleaning out the pec minor, whether it's with something like a, a MOBO or, um, you know, an acu, uh, a acupressure ball, something like that, to clean out that pec minor usually does much more wonders in getting that hand behind the back than doing, you know, taking somebody and cranking them into a sleeper stretch. Because um, that type of deal, if you talk to Eric Cressy, he's, he's, you know, he's never having any of his people, and these are people who need really dynamic internal rotation. 
never having any of them do a sleeper stretch. Now, that's not to say that it should never be done, but it should be done once you've checked a whole lot of other boxes. Like how many times have we taken somebody in a course and their shoulder mobility when we test them in an FMS shoulder mobility screen is significantly different one side to the other. And all we do is do some breathing and some T-spine work. And all of a sudden, next thing you know, they picked up five, six inches of range and we never touch the glenohumeral joint. Now imagine you skipped all those steps. You didn't have a checklist and now you just lay them on their side and crank them into a painful sleeper stretch. A, it's just gonna fight back and stiffen up even more because, or B, even if you get the range, you're gonna never control it because you don't have ownership of that new range. You have naive range of motion. Or C, you may actually really make them worse and now you've destabilized that joint even worse. So that's one of the big things is like shoulder stuff gone wrong. Um, uh, you know, we could make a whole series on that. So like, tell me something else, like shoulder stuff. You're like, you hear it all the time. And it's like, that's no, that's, that's not right. And it's almost like these, these common mythologies of, of things we should do for our shoulders. Um, and, and that's, that's the one that I see is that I can't reach behind my back. So I'm going to crank you into a sleeper stretch. Yeah. I mean, so, and again, that, that goes on to the people think of shoulder mobility, they always think I'm going to core joint. And, and um, I'll give you a, a pretty significant example, too, of something that uh, I've heard from a couple of clients where, you know, I'm like, how'd you hurt your shoulder? Well, they were, they were in their car, they were like a stoplight, they needed to reach into the back seat, right? So obviously, when you're reaching into the back seat, you're not thinking to yourself, okay, you know, it, am I diaphragmatically breathing? How is my T-spine to the right? How is my, you know, abduction and, and shoulder extension? You're not thinking that, but I can't tell you how many people they go to, you know, I've heard it from probably five or six of my clients over the years. They go to reach, they don't have that positioning. And all of a sudden they just get this burning sensation or this really, really significant cramp. And then their shoulders pissed off for a week. And, and here's why that happened, guys, is um, again, we talk about the complexity of the shoulder, but guess what? If you just take your shoulder and you try to reach it to that end range position, a position that you're not acclimated to, um, you're, you're, you're potentially putting your shoulder in a position to, to irritate more of that soft tissue. But again, if you just have the ability to rotate a little bit, well, guess what? You're going to be able to, you're going to, be able to reach into that position. And in the SFMA, um, we look at the, uh, and this is in the clinical component of, of, of FMS, it's the SFMA, the Selective Function Movement Assessment. They look at um, um, uh, multi-segmental rotation, and that is just how sort of everything tends to move in concert. But at the same time, it is super important. But um, but that's just another example of like shoulders, uh, shoulders gone bad. I feel I feel like it's a yeah I feel like it's a series coming up soon. I I have to joke at that. But um, one of the things that you uh, you talked about earlier, and this is going to lead us into our guest for next week as well, is you talked about shoulder extension. And shoulder extension for those of you that don't know is essentially that shoulder extension. Most people think of flexion of the is the primary one, but shoulder extension. And as someone that teaches a lot of kettlebells. Um, we teach a get up and the get up is a, is a pretty dynamic exercise with a bunch of, of positions for sure. But when you roll to the elbow and then go up to the post position, when you're here, you've got one arm into flexion and one arm and extension. It's that reciprocal movement, right? That's what our body really thrives off of. But one of the restrictions we do see in the down arm is shoulder extension. And if you cannot access shoulder extension, that portion of the get up is going to be super challenging because you're essentially asking your body to go into a position that um, you're not very, very comfortable with. And uh, I think next week, that's going to be a nice topic that we can sort of segue on because next, next week, we're going to have uh, one of our first guests on here, and that's going to be Brett Jones. And, and uh, Brett is... Uh, you know, lead instructor for FMS. He's been involved. He's taught for Perform Better. He is the director of education for Strong First. He knows a few things about get-ups. Um, he's the guy that taught me about it. And uh, we're going to we're gonna dig uh, pretty deep with Brett on all things sort of kettlebell related, but we're absolutely going to talk about um, shoulder mechanics because I, I do think that um, understanding those nuances of the get-up is going to be super, uh, super important as well. So, but we've, we've covered uh, quite a few things today, guys. And uh, Eric, anything you want to close this on? Yeah, I guess the, the other thing since that, that I didn't bring up when we talk about posture and we talk about habits and how you, you, know, like you talked about these, these adaptations and, uh, from habitual things is we know that, that tissues will adaptively shorten, right? So if you sit all the time, your hip flexors that used to be this long now will actually drop sarcomeres and shorten. 
and at the hip flexor, that's going to then pull you into extension and get you to kind of hang on your low back and tilt your pelvis forward. Well, let's think about what, what can happen in the shoulder from that standpoint is you spend a night sleeping like this, right? Now that upper trap that was this long normally, now it's been stuck in this position for eight hours, right? And now you wake up the next day and it's not gonna go just rebound back to that other position. And now you're like, my shoulder's a little funky. And this is, this is whether you're you know, a young athlete or whether you're somebody that, that's just you know, looking to go about their day. And now that adaptive shortening has happened. And so posture and positioning when we're sleeping is, is, is pretty important too. When we think about the shoulder, are we lying on the shoulder? Are we laying face down where we're getting a bunch of lumbar extension and we're bringing a hand up here, we're gonna adaptively shorten stuff there. And I've seen a bunch of people that have come in with shoulder stuff because of that. And again, if I'm gonna try to compete with a, with a, a mobility drill for 30 seconds on each side, versus eight hours of sleeping every night with one shoulder jammed up in this funky position, um, it, you know, or even your, your pillow position in terms of your cervical position is going to change that. So that's something to consider as well. So this is like a 24 hour thing. Um, and it can't just be, Hey, like I joked that use a 30 second doorway stretch is, is going to undo all that and, and put you back in position. So Shoulders are pretty complex, and we even really touch on a lot of the dynamics of, of the strength and conditioning, the, the, the performance aspects of the shoulder, the, the alignment aspects of, of things we're going to coach, and, turn, and even the programming aspect, right? The programming aspect of, of do I do more pushing or pulling or, or vertical versus horizontal pushing and pulling. All those factors have to come into play. So there's a lot to unpack, but we just wanted to kind of just get it out there because, uh, you know, there's, there's a fair amount of people that are walking through our doors and walking out in the world that have some sort of shoulder issue that is limiting their ability to do what they want to do. And then you have other people that are on the performance side that their shoulder is the, is the, uh, the limiting factor and that they're not able to express their strength because they can't get that force to go from, from the middle out to their hand and back and back and be able to absorb it back in. So a lot going on there. Um, yeah, and as you mentioned, very excited to get our old friend Brett to jump in with us next week. That should be fun, talking kettlebells. And I'm just going to sit back and enjoy the ride on that one because you guys are the experts there. Um, so uh, good stuff coming up this week, and I'm sure we'll have plenty of good posts about the kettlebell, about some kettlebell stuff this week. Um, and then if you have any questions or you have any ideas for materials that you'd like us to cover, please you know, shoot us a, a DM or, or shoot us an email at principles of program design at Gmail. Uh, we are finalizing the website, should hopefully be up in the next week, week and a half. We have our first live course is gonna be May 1st in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, just out of, outside of PA. And we also should have the online course ready to launch uh, in the next two weeks as well. So stay tuned for that. Absolutely, and there's gonna be uh, uh, some speaking engagements where Eric and I are gonna actually be out traveling a little bit. Are we allowed to uh, to talk about that quickly or? Yeah, we can talk about anything you want, really. Well, I just didn't know about with yeah. your scenario. So, um, you know, well, anyway, so I'm gonna be, uh, I'll be speaking for Perform Better. Um, I'm not sure of the locations. It's probably gonna be two out of the, probably I'm thinking it's gonna be Providence and Chicago, maybe Orlando. Um, but I'm actually going to be talking about principal program design. So that is my topic for, for the next year at Perform Better. And um, we're going to take a lot of this information that Eric and I are covering, and I'm going to condense it into a 75-minute lecture at those locations. But you're going to be doing some lecturing as well, right? Unfortunately, the two I have, right, the two ones, the, the two that I locked up this week are both virtual. Um, they haven't gone completely to in person, but I'll be doing the Northeast ACSM uh, conferences April 8th. Uh, and I'll be talking about uh, recovery and specifically how that relates to readiness and, and programming properly for, for recovery. And then uh, later in the summer, uh, Canfoot Pro. Uh, I'm going to be uh, talking about uh, the performance pyramid that we talk about in the course and those 60 elements and how we kind of took Greg Cook's three-tier you know, performance pyramid. And I took that and blew it out and, and add a whole bunch of, of sub elements to that. And we're going to break down what makes an athlete and, and how we go about approaching how to make them a better athlete. Absolutely. So yeah, guys, um, if there's anything you're looking for us to cover, anything programming wise, uh, questions, it could be about power development, strength, um, you name it. Um, we've been doing this for, uh, 
you know, a collective of, of over probably 45 years or so. So we've made enough mistakes where we, we tend to know the right answers for most of this stuff. But uh, appreciate you guys tuning in. We're going to be sharing this here in a few minutes. Um, you can always go back and, and, and take a listen as well. But uh, if you guys have any questions, you guys can shoot us a DM either on our personal pages here or Eric Degatti or at Principles of Program Design on Instagram. So appreciate you guys and uh, we'll see you next week.